Hey there, folks. Rel here. Welcome to the Untitled TTRPG Podcast. Uh, today I have with me John. We're going to be answering uh, the question, when is a system too bloated? I was, uh, was watching a YouTube video from a smaller creator that just kind of popped up on my feed. And one of their complaints about 5th edition is that the system was bloated. Um, and this is a common complaint from a lot of people who have been playing 5th edition for a long time, especially with the 2024 rules coming out. And there have been um, a few content creators, like Treant Monk is the one that comes to mind, that's been advocating for, you know, when the new player's handbook comes out, don't worry about backwards compatibility, just play with the new core rules options. Um, and part of it has to do with concerns about the balance of backwards compatibility. But what was just really interesting is uh, at the same time, there were a lot of videos from popular content creators like Ginny D and Pack Tactics, where they were allowed to have uh, direct conversations with Jeremy Crawford, uh, the lead rules designer of 5th edition at the moment. And one of the things he kept saying was like, if there's a updated version of old content, like say the Divination Wizard um, or the Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer, you know, use the version from 2024. But it, you're still like, he's still advocating for, you know, using rules from Xanathar's or Tasha's if they haven't been updated. Um, and what was really interesting is that kind of almost feeds into one of the concerns about 5th edition, which is the fact that it's bloated. There's, there's too many options. So I agree with this general sentiment that's being voiced um, by a good number of people in the community. But it did beg the question for me, like, when, what's the line where a system becomes bloated? Like, when Xanathars came out back in 2017, I didn't feel this way. But now that uh, pretty much, actually, when Big B's Glory of the Giants came out, it didn't even add a whole lot. But, like, it felt like, ah, it's just another thing to keep track of. Like, I wasn't excited about it. It was more like, oh, my gosh, more things to worry about. So I wonder if that has to do with the the content cadence. So when I think about bloat, and especially as, so I, I've been in this position where I have to design a game that is uh, expanding in scope to appeal to multiple audiences. And ultimately, <clears throat> what you're creating is not relevant to everyone in your audience. And this is, it's an unfortunate thing because if you have a really narrow focus, then it's very easy to to cater to one particular audience and you just keep hitting that beat and you, you try to, to get the most value um, for the majority of, of people as, as you can. Uh, at the same time, you it's a little bit more difficult to create, I think, s supplemental um, material because there's, if you have a really narrow scope, because there's only, there's only one... Um, access to like uh, align yourself to so if you if you're like dungeons and dragons uh, on, on the other side of it where they have so many different types of players they have so much lore that exists within the game they have all these different types of species and settings you know like like eberron and just like all all sorts that are vastly different so you can create content that caters to or ex expands um, into different areas uh, of that game. But at the same time, there's this weird meshing that takes place where all of the content seems to be universally applied to our the, the game that we're playing. So when you when you see a guide, you know, the Strixhaven, uh, you see the spells that you want to use out of it, that might be a problem for the for the game that you're playing where those spells are either you know, overpowered or they don't need to be used or, you know, the, the quirky things that come out of a setting guide. And we have the onus of like parsing through that information, figuring out what is and isn't worth using. So it's not made clear what the game is supposed to be. And I think any time that you enter that situation, uh, not catering to a, a specific audience with the core of the game, you're at risk of this. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, I think organization has a lot to do with it. So, um, for example, for a non TNT game, uh, when the OGL crisis happened in the beginning of 2023, like a lot of people, I was like, huh, maybe um, I'll jump ship to Pathfinder and try to convert my table over. 
Um, so I went online because one of the nice things about Pathfinder Second Edition is pretty much all their options are for free online. Unlike D&D, where a lot of it is, you know, gate kept on D&D Beyond through price walls and stuff. Um, but one of the things that overwhelmed me was like, I'd be like, classes. And there's like 30 classes there. And it's not like these are the 10 core classes that most people will play. And these are more niche classes that, you know, you only pay attention to for specific, you know, game settings or game styles. It, it was just like a flood. It was a complete overload. So um, now I, I don't play Pathfinder enough to feel confident to say the system is bloated, but having come from oh, the D &D, system totally bloated. Okay, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say that even to somebody who doesn't play Pathfinder but sees yeah. a lot of Pathfinder, uh, it's of course it is, and the reason for it is that anytime that you're creating a system that has that's meant to monetize over a long period of time, you're going to continue to add layers on top, and. Like we said before, if your system is broad, the risk of it feeling bloated and not like a cohesive system, you know, you're creating a game right now. If it's meant to be a foundation to build on, it will eventually get to the point where it's bloated. I, I'm, I'm calling it in advance. You look at my crystal ball. Mine too. Distal is absolutely, I I try so hard to, to like pare things down. But at the same time, I'm like, man, I really want to create this new class. And every time you add another like axis on, it's going to, it's, it's just going to get more difficult to parse the information. So what kind of experience do you want? Do you want a really tight core experience or do you want a tight core experience to then build and, and branch and explore uh, into? So the, the goal of why you're building a TTRPG probably factors into this a lot as well. Bloat isn't one of those things where there's like a, a real easy indicator to point to to be like our system went from not being bloated to suddenly it is really bloated so for me i find that when there's not a clear indicator um just follow-up questions tend to be helpful um i think the one that sticks out to me most is uh how many resources do you need to worry about physically carrying in order to understand how your character operates. So one of the things early on in GMing I noticed, um, you know, playing in games and working alongside a lot of professional game masters is just how much stuff they'd bring. Like they need to take like two or three uh, trips out to their car with like these huge briefcases full of minis and dice and terrain. And, you know, when it, you're looking at the books, they've got like six or seven books. And it's like, do you need all that to run a game? It's if like a clout thing, though, too. It's yeah. your, uh, showing your, your TTRPG cred. See, and I took the opposite approach, which is how can I pare it down so that I don't need, you know, help getting all my stuff from the car into the gaming room. It's like, can I do it with like just one small backpack? <laughs> and uh, and so really, I started noticing it when basically if you needed more than like two or three books, like to me, that's when all of it you're you might be creeping into bloat territory. Just for just for a single character to run. I think that there could be kind of a hard line that you can draw when a system starts to get bloated. And I think that's when the when the goals of the content that you're creating differ from the goals of the system that you designed originally. Uh, that's just it's a loose thought. So it, it may not make sense, but when I'm thinking about it, I think about when you're you're branching into different settings that then double back and affect the core game. I think maybe that's that's a key indicator that you'd say like okay things are starting to get out of hand yeah well and that that is one of the benefits of the rules refresh is they can revisit what the core identity is of the game and uh, clarify it so um one of the things that's interesting is uh i tree and monk today because we're recording on the day the embargo lifts um for all of the the fifth edition phb details and one of the things that, you know, I, I kind of I like um, that they did is that they condensed like the general rules section of the player's handbook. So like ability scores used to be like 10 or 15 pages. And now the entire rules are like a page and a half. Um, so there are a lot of little rules in there that would make you think that D&D &D is more of like a dungeon crawl exploring type game. You know, they have specific rules for how to squeeze into a tight space that they've uh, they've 
condensed really um and then you know there's there's specific rules for mounted combat and underwater combat used to be like you didn't have disadvantage if you had a spear a trident or a crossbow like it's super specific but it's been remade into something more generalized so i think that fifth edition out of the gate to be honest i'm not sure they were super clear on what kind of game they wanted to make even looking at the adventure modules like tyranny of dragons princes of the apocalypse and what was the third one uh oh out of the abyss three super different adventure types that they all worked with the system but um they they just there wasn't like a cohesive game system where you're like oh this is a dungeon crawling game or oh this is a narrative focused game like um dagger heart so i think that now that they're revisiting the rules it might be a little easier to, like you said, create content that reinforces what the core system is trying to deliver. So TTRPGs in general are make-believe story time with friends. And I wonder if that desire for a, a more narrow scope is actually based on this generation's growing up with video games. And I wonder if, uh, you know, the, the dungeon crawling experience and, you know, or you know, you mentioned mounted combat. I'm sure travel factors into some things too. Like, I wonder if those are kind of all meant to be more like mini games within this overall ecosystem of do whatever you want in this world. Because that to me is kind of the spirit of TTRPGs where you do just sit down and kind of play however your table plays. And I don't really need such a narrow experience when a game like Dungeons and Dragons has the history of being so broad and kind of unlimited in its potential. So, yeah, I, I don't really know if, um, if if that is the the problem. And I don't even know that necessarily 2024 edition Dungeons & Dragons needs to clarify what they are in order to create a, a solid core experience. I think you could have both. Given that 5th edition is bloated, you know, why is bloat such an issue? Um, and my answer is that it just creates a greater barrier to entry. So like I said, with Pathfinder, when I tried to get into second edition, I was overwhelmed by just the sheer breadth of content and really had a hard time even getting started because there was so much to parse through. If you're making a game that is intended to appeal to a broad audience, it has to be more accessible, which is the point that you're getting at. And at the same time, it's contrasting with what the veteran audience is looking for. There's an expectation that this many lineages need to be in the game. There was a little bit of blow up when Unearthed Arcana was trying to introduce the new, what was that lineage with like, you could be, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, the Ardling. The, the Ardling, right. Because people were like, no, this, isn't, this doesn't feel like D&D &D to me. And... So the, there were some goals from the studio. The studio was like, okay, we need to try to like introduce a Beastlands into, into the core game so that we can then expand and build upon it. So there was some pushback against that as well, which I agree with. It makes sense for it to be in an expansion, and I'm sure it will. And so these contrasting interests, I think, just make it a little bit difficult to create a, a cohesive experience. And because of that, you kind of have to expect that there's going to be bloat in D&D. &D. And in fact, when Jeremy Crawford markets all the like, you can do this now and you can do this just like you used to be able to, but more and better and extra, that sort of marketing is just like, yeah, the game is bloated now. It's fine because this is all for the veterans who really understand the game. And they're the ones who are going to be watching these videos. They're the ones who are going to be making the content that's ultimately going to promote the game. So it's catered toward them. At the same time, I will say that I don't know, the, despite Jeremy Crawford's uh, marketing uh, kind of push toward like you can do more and everything, I don't actually know that the core experience is going to be that much different for a new player in 2024. If anything, I think it'll be better, despite the the bloat, because they've refined game in a lot of other areas as well like you were talking about with the with the rules that were used to be about attributes you know 10 pages long or whatever they've they figured out the parts to trim away 
and that ultimately is going to help the accessibility front. So get a little bit of both, I think. So something all this reminds me of, um, which I think is it's just really interesting, especially talking about bloat and how much content has come out since fifth edition came out. You know, you're talking about how broad the game is and how many different audiences it's trying to capture. Um, Jim Davis uh, from WebDM uh, years ago at this point, I can't even remember the video he mentioned it in, but he just said this like offhand comment that I have not been able to stop thinking about for a while, which is even in the base monster manual, there are too many monsters to effectively world build. And I thought that was so interesting uh, that he put it that way because it, it is kind of true. Like there's so many different flavors of monsters and so many, much different lore that it's really difficult to make like a, a tonally cohesive experience. You know, it, it, playing Baldur's Gate 3 to me also highlighted it. You, you have some classic fantasy monsters in there, like, you know, trolls and goblins and ogres and stuff. But um, you also start off with a weird mind flayer tentacle ship battling like dragons being ridden on by strange alien people who apparently are not native to um, the material plane. Like that's some that's a dialogue option you can have when talking to uh, to Lazel is just like, hey, I've never seen a gith before. <laughs> so it, it is kind of interesting to think about. On the, the Dungeon Master side of things, even with just the core rules of the game, how much do you pare down? How much do you kind of take away in order to create a tonally cohesive experience? I think that that is why it's so common to homebrew your own setting from scratch. Because you can pull enough of the, the common understood elements of like, oh yeah, no elves exist. And, uh, you know, trolls exist and giants exist and dragons exist and all of it can, you can, you can pull in a bunch of, uh, species from the, the regular core rules and it'll still all make sense because it's close enough. We have a cultivated understanding from Tolkien, Gygax, mythology in general of what to expect. And as long as you have that, I think you can effectively world build. So I, I wonder and what context Jim Davis is, is talking about. Because if you if you need to adhere to uh, this is Forgotten Realms, this is how things work, and build on top of that, your work is cut out for you. If you were to uh, trim down a game, let's, let's say D&D. If you were to hack it up, make it into a singular, non-bloated core experience, where would you start? That is an awesome question. Uh, I think where I would start would be the class design. Um, so I think they, they've talked about this on the Eldridge lore cast, but I think even conceptually, um, one of the things I've been having more and more of a problem with in fifth edition in particular is the fact that subclasses in a lot of cases are niches built upon niches. Um, and because of that, it makes it harder to make kind of like these generalized things. So what I mean by that is like, let's talk about Big B's Glory of the Giants. The one subclass that's introduced there is a barbarian subclass. And it's whole like functional thing that separates it from all other barbarian subclasses is that you can add your range damage to thrown weapons <laughs> which you couldn't do before and like all of the mechanics are built around the specific function of picking things up and throwing them which it's like a niche on a niche to me barbarian and this a lot of people might get upset by this barbarian is like should be like a fighter subclass like the fighter that can rage and just charge straight in and get the job done and take extra punishment doesn't need to be expanded on by its own set of subclasses. And what's interesting is in the more niche class design is also where you start to see gross power imbalances like right away. So even in the player's handbook, Bear Totem Barbarian is like the good one and then everything else is not as good. <laughs> and you know, when we got Xanathar's Zealot Barbarian started to compete with it, 
but like storm herald was a niche built through the rage condition and it just it it was a little too much so even in the 2014 player's handbook there is a lot of thematic overlap so yes if you wanted a nature prayer person you could build a druid or you could build a nature domain cleric or you could build an oath of the ancients paladin and i i think that to pare it down to really like create these kind of core easily understood classes i think that it's just so much simpler to keep them separate do you want the nature plant person that's the druid do you want the holy light sacred flame person that's the cleric you don't need a divine soul sorcerer that's doing something similar but also has these niche meta magic options that's where i think the bloat comes in it's an asset for D and D because now they can release extra products to have that thematic overlap. But to me, I think that it makes the, the thematic concepts a little bit harder to digest for new players. Hmm. I think if, if I had to take a knife to, to D and D or an ax, maybe it would be to restructure how expansions work. I think that Curse of Strahd should probably be its own setting guide instead of an, ad, an adventure uh, to the point where it should feel like a totally different game. So you're creating very clear divisions between uh, the, the settings and the core rules then at that point can can mostly be just like the base book that you need a very generic doesn't have maybe well i guess it has to have some lore stuff in it that's a weird situation it doesn't really need to have that much lore um, you can you can create a generic like these are the rules and then release you know like a setting book on top of it maybe i i don't think people would really jive with that idea um now that it comes out of my mouth but when you're you're focusing on curse of strahd uh, it's, it's such a niche within the fantasy space being, you know, doom, doom and gloom and kind of just grim, uh, and dark and that sort of thing. So you, you should almost have different classes or have very strict limitations on like, Hey, if you're playing through this adventure, don't play through these, or these classes aren't really valid. These abilities aren't really valid. Stop touching the other books because they're not relevant. I would, I would make it abundantly clear that everything is kind of a self-contained experience then at that point D D becomes less of a oh it's D D, it's the the system or uh the D, the uh it, like the the ip and like you always expect all the the dragons and that sort of stuff and then it becomes more of a just a framework for for whatever you layer on top of it which is what they're trying to do but it's like this weird in-between place where it's like yeah you can also pull everything from these other books so we can't do that, can't go back in time, but if I were to approach it starting over, and it would probably honestly be less successful than D&D is now if you were to go that route because everything would se seem like really isolated. So when it comes to making money, it's not a good option. When it comes to preserving the integrity of the game, that's how it goes. Well, that is always the central conflict, right? Yeah. Like, um, I, I think like setting guides like even back in ad and d like just they didn't sell well so it um so part of the strat and this led to bloat but you know to again pick on big b's glory of the giants you know part of what they have to try to do is give a little bit of player options to make players want to pick it up but then also give some lore stuff uh, which dungeon masters find interesting and which the creators are actually passionate about. So they have to try to like going back to placating multiple audiences, you know, they've got to try to do a little bit of everything to give everyone a reason to pick it up, even though really you're only picking it up for like uh, a fraction of what the total book offers. Um, which again, from a formatting perspective makes it much more confusing. I, I don't know, but yeah, that it, it is, that is the central tension is, Will this product sell versus is it preserving the integrity of a game experience we're trying to deliver? I think that is about where we wrap it up, because frankly, that's what it comes down to is 
if you want to create a system that is mindful of bloat, you have to understand how you're going to uh, create money off of it without also uh, detracting from the, the core of the experience. Think about it and uh, let us know what you think in the, uh, the comment section down below. That's it. That's all I got. Thanks very much, folks. They're all signing off.